Our first speaker, we're going to have Barry come on up, Pastor Barry. Um, there. Pastor Barry and his wife, Terry, uh, they live and reside in Orange County, California, my home stomping ground. Uh, they've been married since 1977. He's the founding pastor and senior pastor of Calvary Chapel, uh, Tustin. And uh, he's the featured speaker of the national broadcast program, The Truth About God. He also does a, uh, another His Channel uh, online update as well called The World News Briefing. He's authored four books. Uh, he's got four grandchildren and two children, of course. And please give a warm welcome to Pastor Barry. Good morning. It is great to be here. Australia has always been on my bucket list of places to visit, and I can't think of a better combination of seeing a beautiful country, beautiful people, and opening God's magnificent word. Amen? Amen. Now, just to uh, introduce our time here this morning, I was thinking about a story of a Sunday school teacher who was asking her 10-year-old class, who can tell me what faith is? And one boy was excitedly waving his hand, which he did at every question she ever asked. And she was hoping someone else would answer. But finally, she gave in and said, okay, Billy, what is faith? And Billy said, that's easy. Faith is believing in stuff you know ain't true. <laughs> Our subject this morning is something that many believe ain't true. And that it's something that has been concocted and even done so recently but I have to say, I am very excited this morning at the possibility that this very day, the Lord could give the command to an angel to blow the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive and remain will forever be with the Lord. Now, our topic this morning is indeed uh, something we're going to look at through two particular lenses. One is something, it's kind of a theological term, it's called hermeneutics. That's just a big, multi-syllable word for interpretation. And we're going to look at our subject this morning through the lens of biblical interpretation. And then also we're going to look at it through the necessity of accurate eschatology. And eschatology being the study of last day's things. Now, our title and topic this morning is simply The Rapture. Biblical Doctrine or Human Invention. So our hermeneutical approach or question is does the Bible teach the rapture? The short answer is, you betcha. But you're not going to get the short answer this morning. I don't think that's why you came, and they gave me 50 minutes, so I'm going to use all of it. <laughs> now, also, I would like to say this. Since the Bible clearly teaches the rapture, let's quote all the verses together where the word rapture is used. Ready? Go. Go. We don't find it in our Bibles, at least. So, how can we arrive at the fact that this is actual, accurate hermeneutics to determine that there is a rapture, a catching away of living believers into the presence of God? Now, one thing we need to address as we open our time together this morning is that there is at least one other major doctrine that the Bible clearly teaches where the word we use to describe it is not contained within the pages of Scripture. And that doctrine is the Trinity. How many believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And there is indeed one true and living God. We describe this as the Trinity, yet we don't find the word Trinity in Scripture. Yet we do find verses like Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, where we're told it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Palestine. Is that what your Bible says? Listen, if you have maps in the back of your Bible and it says Palestine, cross it off and write the actual name of that geographic region, which is Israel. Amen? Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So there we have the physical manifestation of the Son. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit. There's a third member of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit, descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, obviously the voice of the Father, who said, You are my beloved Son. 
in whom I am well pleased. So here in this particular scene, we see the three distinct personages of the one and true living God. Now, let me just say this as kind of an added bonus. This pretty much decimates the teaching that is sadly making its way around the world known as oneness Pentecostalism or even modalism. And what that belief is, is that there is truly one God who manifests himself in these distinct personages in different ways and at different times. So the conclusion then would be when we arrive in heaven, there will be no Father, there will be no Holy Spirit, there will only be Jesus. Well, the verses we just read poke a rather large hole in that balloon. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make up the triune Godhead. We describe it as the Trinity. Trinity is not in the Bible. Rapture isn't in our English translations, but it is clearly taught. And that's where you say, Amen. Amen. So we have a proper hermeneutic. What about accurate eschatology? Now there are some who propose that the rapture of the church is kind of a Johnny-come-lately amongst biblical doctrines. And it was actually a fabrication of one man's imagination because of an encounter he had with a young woman who had some dreams. And this theologian and scholar from the 19th century is named John Nelson Darby. And often he is listed as the initiator of the belief in the rapture. Now Darby was certainly influential in reintroducing the doctrine of the rapture to mainstream Christian thinking, but he wasn't the delusional goofball that many say he was who was influenced by a young woman and her dreams. Listen, a little background on Darby. He is one of the five most prolific authors of the church age. He personally founded somewhere around 1,500 churches during the time of his ministry on earth. He translated the entire Bible into three languages, English, French, and German, and the New Testament into five languages, adding Dutch and Italian. John Nelson Darby has been described as one of the most important Christians since the Reformation period. But I do want to say this. Our time today is not about John Darby. Our time today is about Jesus Christ and the living word of God and what it has to say to us about this issue that is being hotly debated in our world today. Now, we'll also, I believe, conclusively settle the matter as to the timing of the rapture. I don't mean the day and the hour, but its placement within or around the 70th week of Daniel. So, here's our question. How can we arrive at the fact that an event that is implied or a belief or uh, doctrine that is not uh, directly named is indeed something that is sound and can be trusted in? Now this morning we're going to use three criteria, which are the criteria for establishing, at least two of them, any doctrine of scripture. And the first is Old Testament precedent or typology. Can we find examples of the rapture or a rapture in the Old Testament? Secondly, in our day, during the church age, we can find in our establishment of doctrines, New Testament clarity. And there is one case specific aspect of our three criteria And that is prophetic necessity. Now that means does the absence of the doctrine of the rapture leave a hole in the prophetic timeline or chronology? Now if we answer these three questions, I believe this morning, not only can we go away believing in the rapture, we can go away defending the doctrine of the rapture. As a matter of fact, that's why the church gathers together, according to Paul in Ephesians 4, we come together to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Part of your ministry, my ministry, is to go to the world and say, Jesus is coming soon, judgment is going to follow, and there is a way of escape that he has made for all who believe in him. The rapture is an important topic as it relates specifically, even more so, to the day and age in which we live. Somebody say, Now, one more thing as it relates to the idea that the rapture just came along recently in the past century and its rise is recent in the uh, popular evangelical thought and circles now something we need to recognize from daniel 12 4 daniel who had magnificent visions tremendous revelations from god was told but you daniel shut up the words and seal the book until when the time of the end until the last days many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase now 
What Daniel was told is that, and what we could understand it as saying, is that those who live closer to the fulfillment of events are going to have better clarity than even the author who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down those events. Daniel was told, hey, shut up those words. They're not for your understanding or for your season of life. They are for the last days and they are specific to them and that being the time of the end. Now, this too is problematic for those who espouse that belief in the rapture is false based solely on its recent popularity. We should know things happening in our world today that are along the prophetic chronology and timeline, both of Old and New Testament. We should be seeing the abounding of lawlessness or the advancing of it in our world today. Is lawlessness abounding in our world today? Are things now doubted and questioned that used to be believed without question within the church even a generation ago? It's all happening. The world is being primed, not just for the tribulation, but the church is being ready for the rapture. Now, we're not going to try and force our belief into the text or the doctrine of the rapture. We're just going to let the Bible speak for itself. So, are you ready this morning? Let's go ahead and start the message. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful this morning for your matchless word. Thank you for the information and details and the very uh, specific things we'll look at this morning that give us confidence and expectancy that we live in a time where we need to be looking up and we need to be reaching out. So help us arrive at those two ends this morning through our time. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's warriors said, Amen. Now, let's take a look at Old Testament typologies or precedents. Now, first of all, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. We know 1 Corinthians is in the Old Testament, right? No, we're going to set the stage for Old Testament typology. Paul said this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not, shall not all sleep, which is an idiom for death, but we shall all be changed. How fast? In a moment. It's described as even in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. How many are looking forward to that change? I think... Everybody that's in, you know, my age bracket, 35 or so, <laughs> I said or so, are looking forward to the change. I was telling the group in Perth, if you're looking for me in heaven, look for the guy with the huge afro. I have never <laughs> had any hair, and I'm looking forward to having some in heaven. I think that's going to be part of the package, or at least I hope it is. Now, the Greek word for mystery is the word mysterion, and it means not obvious to the understanding. And Paul says there are things contained in Scripture that are not obvious to the understanding that are going to require a bit of digging and investigation. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Now, think about the statue of Daniel 2, the metals and descending value and all that they symbolized was not necessarily clear at the time, but now looking back in history, we can see quite clearly what that statue represented. It talked about the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar was told he was the head of gold. Then inferior kingdoms would follow. The Medo-Persian Empire. Then the Greek Empire. And finally the Roman Empire in two phases. And you and I have the advantage now of looking back and seeing those prophecies fulfilled, except for the second manifestation of the revived Roman Empire. Now the first thing we need to do when looking for a foreshadowing in the Old Testament is to understand exactly what the rapture is. Now what the rapture is by definition, not the translation of the word, but rather the definition, is an instantaneous translation of living human beings into the eternal realm. The rapture is the instantaneous translation of living human beings into the eternal realm. So, can we find examples of this in the Old Testament? You can say yes. You know that's going to be the answer. Now, first of all, in Genesis 5.21, we're told about Enoch. He lived 65 years, and he begot a son named Methuselah. Methuselah means his death shall bring. And when Methuselah died, the flood came. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for what happened to him? 
God took him. Was he alive when God took him? Yes, he was. So we have the supernatural translation of a living human being into the eternal realm in Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Now the word took is key. The Hebrew means to fetch or to carry away. And that's what's going to happen with you and I. We are going to be carried away into the presence of the Lord and forever be with him. I'm going to wait for something there. I can't mean, come on, that was, that's some pretty good stuff right there. Now, 2 Kings 2.11, we also find it happened as they continued on and talked, Elisha and Elijah, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into Melbourne. <laughs> well, where'd he go? He went into heaven. So what do we have here? We have the supernatural translation of a living human being from the temporal realm into the eternal. So based on our findings of just these two examples, and listen, we don't need a hundred, two is sufficient. In the Old Testament, we find living human beings being taken into the eternal realm. Now, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 also reminds us that they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from what? From the wrath to come. That tells us that there is a season of wrath that is going to come on the whole world and we're going to be delivered from it. Now we'll deal with other New Testament scriptures concerning our deliverance from God's direct wrath, but this at least introduces the concept for us. Now, let me ask you again. Is there an Old Testament precedent of living human beings being supernaturally translated into the eternal realm? Yes, yes or no? Yes, there is. So we've established our first criteria. And yet, some say the church will go through the tribulation because... People have always gone through tribulation. Well, there's a distinction between tribulation and life. In this life, you will have tribulation. I never get an amen to that. <laughs> but it's true, right? In this life, you will have tribulation. But there's a distinction between the tribulations we experience and the great tribulation that comes upon the whole world. Now, as far as Old Testament types of deliverance from wrath, and that's the second component of the definition of the rapture, we're supernaturally translated because we're being delivered from wrath. And we can find precedents and types of this in the Old Testament as well. Consider, Noah was delivered from God's wrath when the ark lifted him above the waters that came upon the whole world as the Lord was destroying all of mankind and everything on the earth at that point in time. Lot was delivered from God's wrath when two supernatural agents arrived and brought him out of the city where God was going to pour out his wrath. The Israelites were delivered from God's wrath with the last seven plagues. God made a distinction between the people of Egypt and the people of God or the Israelites uh, between the third and fourth plagues that came upon his people, or came upon Egypt. Now I say this because this is kind of interesting. We will go through tribulation in life, right? The people of God in Egypt shared in the tribulations that they were experiencing, or the plagues that the Egyptians were experiencing, during plague one, two, and three. God said between three and four, none of this is going to come upon my children, but only on the Egyptians, which are a typology of the world. Now I know it's early, but let's do some math together. 10 minus 3 is? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Where are you guys at over here? Come on. 10 minus 3 is? Seven. 7. How long is the tribulation? Seven. 7 years. So I think that's a rather interesting and curious parallel. Now, two things I think we need to recognize. The Israelites were still on the planet, some say. And that means that the, the typology breaks down, but it really doesn't. Some even say that means the church will go through the tribulation because Israel was still in Egypt when God was pouring out the plagues. Now, the first thing regarding that argument is Israel is Israel and the church is the church. Amen. There are two distinct manifestations of God's people. And whenever I encounter a Jew, uh, especially in Israel and some in Orange County, I will always tell them, I believe that the Jews are God's chosen people by birth. 
The church is God's chosen people by faith, and we have been grafted in very graciously by the King of kings and Lord of lords. God, that's just really bad. Come on. I mean, again. <laughs> Amen? Now, pay close attention. Are you here? Neither Lot nor Noah were Jews. Neither men were Jews. Both men were separated from the wrath of God. And yet we know during the plagues that came down upon Egypt, the Israelites were still in Egypt or in the proximity where God's wrath was being poured out through the, through the plagues, yet they were protected throughout the duration of the final seven plagues. Now, we're told in Exodus 8, to 23, And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people, Tomorrow this sign will be. Yes, Israel remained in Egypt, which is a type of the world, during the time of the last seven plagues, but God supernaturally protected them from what he was doing with the Egyptians so they would let his people go so they could worship him. Noah was removed from the flood when the door of the ark was shut by the hand of God himself. Lot was removed from the wrath of God when the angels met him and led him out of Sodom. So in the case of Noah and Lot, we have a supernatural agent and a change of location that delivered them from the wrath of God, which is what is going to happen to the church. In Egypt, we have the divine protection of the Jews during seven plagues that God was pouring out on the Egyptians, again, a type of the world, which is what is going to happen during the tribulation. The Jews will be on the planet except for men like my dear brother Amir who is a Christian Jew uh, he's going in the rapture I'm pretty sure <laughs> amen yeah. but unbelieving Jews are going to go through the tribulation and the believing remnant who will look upon the one whom they pierced which we'll talk about this afternoon are going to be protected by God so we have a precedent in the Old, in the Old Testament of a supernatural translation of living human beings from this life into the next, and the removal of God's people, those who please God, as it was said of uh, Enoch, he walked with God, and he had this testimony that he pleased God. He was moved from the direct wrath of God, and the Jews in the Old Testament were protected during a time of plagues. Now, the rapture. The catching away by forth of God's people at the sound of a trumpet blast given by a supernatural agent to meet the Lord in the air before he pours out his wrath on the world. So therefore, we have established Old Testament precedent and typology, and that's where you say amen. amen. So what about New Testament clarity? Some say, okay, the word rapture is in present, so we can't make a case for it through the language used. How then is the mystery of the old made clear in the new? Now, the first thing we need to deal with is the initial statement that the rapture isn't in the Bible. The word rapture, I should say. Now, is the word gracias in your Bible? Come on, that's easy. Unless you speak Spanish, no. In our English Bibles, the word gracias is not in our Bible, but you will find it in the Spanish Bible. And the fact is, the word rapturos is contained in a Latin Bible, and it is the word we would translate as rapture. So the word rapture is not in your Bible. The concept is taught, but it is used in the Latin Bible. So in that case, uh, if you are a student of the ancient languages and read a Latin Bible, how many read Latin here today? Raise your hand. Yeah, me either. But the word is in the scripture, just not our Bible. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until when? The coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Again, an idiom for those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from where? Heaven. Heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the, in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Now, I'm sure most of you have heard that the word translated uh, into the two words caught up is the Greek word harpazo. And it means to pluck. It means to pull away or catch up by force. Not catch up like you put on french fries, but catch up. <laughs> now, Paul says, living people are going to be caught up together with the dead saints and meet the Lord in the air and forever be with him. And that last statement carries with it some wonderful implications, including the instantaneous translation of living human beings into the eternal realm. Because in order to be with the Lord forever, we need a new package. We need a new body. Amen? Amen. How many have noticed in the mirror that that person is looking different than they used to uh, (laughs) some years ago? I think we all have that uh, occasion where we look in the mirror and say, what in the world happened? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55, Paul adds this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Again, the Greek word mysterion, something that needs some investigation to understand. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, twinkling of an eye, as we read earlier, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised. How? Incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption, or corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Paul says, we're not all going to die, but there is a specific generation that is going to be translated into the presence of the Lord and forever be with him because they have put on, by necessity, immortal incorruptibility. Now, how fast? In the twinkling of an eye. We're meeting the Lord where? In the air. air. How long are we going to be with him? Forever. Forever. Will death continue to be a threat? No. No. So, what would be the figurative meaning of the passage we just read if it's not referring to the literal rapture of the church? What would be our allegorical lessons? What would be our spiritual application from being told we're not all going to die? From being told we're all going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? What could you spiritualize that into if you don't take the literal futurist view like I believe we all should? Now, It can't be talking about the soul because the soul is already eternal. We're born with a soul. Everyone is going to live forever in the sense of where your address is another question, but you are going to, your soul is going to live forever, either in the presence of God and the holy angels and the heavenly experience or in the eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Yes, thank you for that. That was very enthusiastic. (laughs) Now, our souls are already immortal. So Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which, from heaven, we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our, what is it? A lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now, Paul said we're not all going to die, which has to pertain to the human body, not the human soul. So these lowly and limited bodies are going to be transformed, which can also be translated as transfigured, into their predestined form of the image, uh, the Greek term is icon, of Christ himself. Now, Romans also tells us in 8.22 to 25, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. The adoption is then defined as the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this what? Hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with what? Perseverance. That's an interesting Greek word. The word is actually a hupomone. It means cheerful endurance. So it's talking about our attitude and waiting for the Lord 
to come for us. And when we go through the seasons of trials and testings and waitings, we do so with cheerful endurance, knowing that there is something wonderful that awaits us that's going to happen really, really fast. Dr. March Hitchcock said one time, uh, rather interestingly, what problem do you have that the rapture wouldn't solve? (laughs) Amen? Amen? We are waiting for our bodies to be redeemed, having been confined to the expectancy of death. Now, Romans 8 doesn't give us the details that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 15, but it does imply that these bodies are going to be transformed into one like death. Christ, and that such a thing awaits us. 1 Corinthians 15 told us the speed of the transition, the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Philippians further explains immortal incorruptibility as the destination of all who believe, and that being in a glorious Christ-like body. So here's our next question and criteria. Does the New Testament give clarity on that which was a mystery in the old regarding the translation of living human beings into the eternal realm? And I think you know the answer. The answer is yes. So we have Old Testament types and precedents. We have New Testament clarity. What about prophetic necessity? Will there be holes in the prophetic narrative if we eliminate the rapture of the church from the church's teaching? I bet you can guess the answer, but we didn't come here to make guesses. We came here to get answers. Amen? So first the question, must all the Bible's prophecies come to pass in order for it to be reliable and trustworthy? Absolutely. If a portion of the Bible doesn't come to pass, then we have a problem with the whole document. I think you can well understand that. And therefore, we can also pose the question, can unconditional and eternal promises be forfeited or applied to another group and the Bible still be a source of immutable, which means unchangeableness, truth? Can things that were promised to Israel all of a sudden apply to the church and Israel be discarded and the Bible maintain its inspired integrity? No. Now, what you must be saying and believing is that when something was once true, it must always be true in order for the Bible to maintain its authority and integrity. And that's what you're saying, right? (laughs) Two of you are saying that. The rest of you get on board. We're going forward. Now... Revelation 6, 15 to 17 says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us because we don't know what's happening to us. Is that what it says? Fall on us and hide us from who? The face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now, in John's day, when he wrote Revelation from uh, the Isle of Patmos or later recorded it in Ephesus, whichever was the case, in John's day, the word every meant every. It means every today as well, right? So we're told of every slave and every free man. In other words, People from all walks of life during the tribulation know that it is him who sits on the throne and the lamb who is pouring out his wrath on the earth. Yet, instead of calling on the creator for forgiveness, they call on the creation to hide them from him who sits on the throne. Are we moving in that direction today where people are worshiping creation instead of creator? It's happening all around us. Rich or poor, slave or free, every person on the earth tries to hide from the wrath of the Lamb. And there's a rhetorical statement that follows, who is able to stand? The implied answer is, no one will be able to stand. Now, in what we just read, did you see the word or phrase, except the church? No, it's not there. Even though the word every is used twice. Now, do we know elsewhere in Scripture where the groom, our Lord, turned on his bride and without discrimination persecuted his own bride and poured out his wrath on the church. Do we have an example of that in the course of history? No. So why would we expect to see that during the tribulation when it's a time period that even those who are in it recognize it's him on the throne and the lamb who is pouring out his wrath? Now the reality for you and I is just this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11, 
God did not appoint us to wrath. I'm sorry, did my mic go off? <laughs> God did not appoint us to wrath. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, meaning live or die, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. Now, remember the word edify comes from a Greek term that we would translate into edifice. It's an architectural term, means to build up. So, because we don't have an appointment with wrath, Paul says build one another up. Now, let me see if this builds you up. You know, some of you are probably going to get killed during the tribulation. How do you feel? You feel better now? <laughs> That's not building us up. Now, if there's no rapture, then there's a discrepancy between 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11 and what we read in Revelation chapter 6. Now, let's add this as we talk about wrapping up. Doesn't necessarily mean we're going to. We're just going to act like we are. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. Now, brethren, there's the audience, brethren, the fellow believers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our what? Gathering together to him. The word gathering together is episynagogy. It means to assemble in one place, or it means the complete collection. When we are all together in the presence of the Lord, Paul says, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, or you missed the complete collection or the gathering together. Let no one deceive you by any means, which implies they're going to try and deceive concerning that day. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes what? What's the next word? First, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed at his own time. The restraining force that keeps the Antichrist from rising to power. For now, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is what? Amen. Taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So the, the one who restrains must be taken out of the way. So the lawless one can be revealed. And God will cease restraining his wrath and pour it out on a Christ-rejecting world, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, the gathering together, I believe, is the rapture of the church, just by definition of the term used, the complete collection to the presence of the Lord, our gathering to him that will be with him always. Now, Interesting that some would like to say that the falling away, or the Greek word apostasia, some like to pronounce it uh, apostasia, but the word apostasia, some believe, which can be translated as departure, though it never is in Scripture. It's only used one other time in Acts 28, 19, I believe it is, and it always talks about because the definition of the word is a defection from truth. Yet some say, because in secular literature it's translated as departure, that it's actually speaking of the rapture. Now, there's a problem with that. If the apostasia is pointing to the rapture, and the gathering together, the episynagogy is pointing to the rapture, then what Paul said to the church was the rapture can't happen unless the rapture happens first. Does that make any sense? No. Paul didn't work for the Department of Redundancy Department. Now, I thought that was better than that. I thought that was pretty good on the fly. Now, Paul says, don't let the words or letters shake you up concerning our gathering together with him. And listen, we shouldn't let the words of the naysayers shake us up today either. People can question these things as they always have. As a matter of fact, it is prophetic, much of the doubting and scoffing that we see today. When Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come when? In the last days. According to the, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing has changed. For this they willfully forget. 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men are there rapture scoffers today well the time has come hasn't it what time is it it's time to look up our redemption is nigh Paul says let no one deceive you about this and then he offers a progression of events that initiate the mark toward, march toward the destruction of the man of sin by the brightness of Jesus second coming now here's our point of interest lawlessness is already at work amen, amen. lawlessness is already at work and what is restraining the rise of the antichrist and his kingdom has to be taken out of the way in order for him to arise to power and have a global system of governance and a religious system headed by the false prophet. And then, and only then, when he who restrains is taken out of the way, can the Antichrist rise to power. Is that clear? Now, what is the restraining force holding back absolute and utter lawlessness in the world today? Who is salt and light? Who is the light of the world? Is that not the church? The work of the Lord through the church is the restraining force of absolute anarchy and it's holding back the rise to power of the Antichrist. So the restraining force through the church has to be taken out of the way in order for the Antichrist to rise to power. Now if you're a student of the Old Testament, you know that Daniel tells us in chapter 9 that the Antichrist makes a covenant with Daniel's people and holy city for the duration of how long? Seven years. So therefore, we need to understand that the period, the time period that the covenant extends to is, and we'll talk a little more about this uh, this afternoon, is the whole of the seven year period. And therefore the church has to be gone in order for the seven year period to begin and the Antichrist rises to power at the very beginning of it. So with that said, that is one of the main reasons I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That is one of the main reasons that I believe that the mid-trib or pre-wrath positions are not biblically sustainable. First and foremost, because the duration of the covenant is an entire seven-year period. And even though it has a partition in the middle where the abomination of desolation takes place, it is still a seven-year covenant. It is still dealing directly with the nation of Israel. And it is still one of the 70 weeks of Daniel and his people and holy city. There's no place in the church for that scenario. Now, you still here? Okay. Luke 21, 34 to 36. But take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray when you have time. Pray when? Always. Always that you may be counted worthy to do what? Escape. Escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man now the word escape means to flee out of and this is a time that jesus described that if he didn't come back and bring it to an end no flesh would survive it's a time of global judgment and therefore the question would be if the church is in the tribulation where do hundreds of millions of christians flee to to escape the wrath of god while he pours it out on the whole world well there's only one answer and solution and that is the rapture the church is not going to go through the tribulation. The church is not going to go through the tribulation. Now, so back to where we began. Does the Bible teach the rapture of the church? Yes. Absolutely. Old Testament precedents and typologies, New Testament clarity and prophetic necessity all demand that it be so. Now, one more thing in conclusion. Jesus in the heart of the Olivet Discourse said in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also be, who knows the next word? Be what? Starts with R, ends with Eddie. That's all you're getting. Therefore you also be ready. 
for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect him. And yet Paul said that this day will not overtake us as a thief. So what Jesus is saying is that when he is going to come, and I believe that the Olivet Discourse does have some content that applies to the church age via the phrase, before the flood. And if you'll, we'll talk more about that again uh, this afternoon. But Jesus is saying that the rapture of the church is going to take place during the latter times, a season of history where the expectancy of his return is low. And this is what we're looking at and hearing in our world today because so many are questioning the doctrine of the rapture, citing that it is a biblical invention, but you and I now know and understand that it is as sound of a doctrine as any other within the pages of Scripture, even though the word rapture isn't in the Bible, and that's where you say, Amen. And Father, again, we are grateful for our time this morning and your word. Thank you that we have an expectation of a hope and future glorification putting on a mortal incorruptibility. We thank you the speed of this translation into your presence is instantaneous and permanent. And Lord, we thank you that you told us many, many things to be looking for. Not so we'll know the day and hour, but so we'll know the proximity is near. So Lord, we're grateful for our time together in your matchless word. I pray for my dear brother Amir as he uh, speaks here in a moment. Lord, that he will tell us about that guy that's going to rise to power that's going to claim uh, to be God himself. So we ask your anointing on him and his time as well. And Lord, as you said to the churches in Revelation, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the churches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.